Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 103, verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I have a message for you this morning on this Father's Day entitled, A Father's Hope. Often on Mother's Day, we hear wonderful messages of the virtues of motherhood and extolling how wonderful mothers are, which they are, and we're thrilled to honor them. And then on Father's Day, most of the time, preachers will come up and beat fathers over the head about why we don't measure up to God, our Heavenly Father, and how much better we should be. And, uh, but today's different, not just because we've passed out beef jerky, but it's different because I want to encourage you and inspire you as fathers uh, and as families to encourage you and to thank you for what you've done and to say, you know what, we don't have to measure up to God, our Heavenly Father, but we can use God as an example for who we are as fathers. So I want to talk with you about that for a few moments today. May we pray. Dear Lord, across this sanctuary and everybody watching and listening to the sound of my voice now, we are coming together in this quiet moment to reflect on your Holy Scripture about your character as a father that we just heard as Jolene read for us but also to dig deep within us and to see how we might mirror you to others, to show your love and your compassion and your kindness, to rise up and to be leaders for you, to shine your love to our children and to all those that we meet. We thank you for that, Lord. We are ready to hear from you. Speak to us, Lord, for we are listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in 19... 10, in Spokane, Washington, a woman named Anna Smart Dodd was noted for coming up with this concept of Father's Day. But as you heard me talk to the children earlier, actually, it was a woman named Grace Clayton, who was from Fairmont, West Virginia, who came up with this concept first two years earlier. Now, I, I assume that eh, Anna Smart Dodd had a better publicist or something because she got some of the credit most of the credit at that point, but it was our friend Grace from over in Fairmont who came up with this idea because of Anna Jarvis, who was also from West Virginia and also another Methodist who came up with this concept of Mother's Day. She thought if mothers can have a day and a Sunday, why can't fathers? And so she campaigned for that and became a nationwide holiday, but it didn't happen right away. This was 1908, and then again across the country because there was not mass communication, 1910. It wasn't until 1915 that they were able to get this concept to President Woodrow Wilson's desk, and he signed a proclamation honoring fathers. And then it was not until 1966 that Lyndon Johnson also signed another proclamation. But it took all the way to 1972 and Richard Milhouse Nixon to finally work with Congress, sign it into law for the third Sunday of June to be Father's Day. Isn't that amazing? From all those years, 1908 all the way through 1972, it finally took President Nixon it together to sign it. I don't know what took so long, but we're thankful that we have these days to honor our fathers. And we thank you, thank uh, those women from West Virginia, those Methodist women who did not give up and did not give in until it worked out. I think that's a beautiful thing and a beautiful legacy, not only for Methodists, but for women leaders and for all of us around the country to appreciate those who started it and who loved their fathers so much that they were not content to stop until there was an official Father's Day. They tell me that the three most popular gifts this year are cordless drill, a Weber grill, or a necktie. So that's kind of interesting. I thought beef jerky might be fun, so we went with beef jerky today. What is it about fathers, and what is it about this concept of fathers that seems almost intangible, but also so strong and so pivotal to people of all ages. You'll notice that as children walk down the street, often they will just raise their hand up. They won't look to see who's, who's above them. They'll just raise their hand up knowing that their parent, in this case their father, would, will reach out and grab their hand immediately. Well, I've searched the Scriptures, and I assume we could spend all afternoon talking about the characteristics of God as our Father. But I've narrowed down, I think, three specific stories and three words that correlate to that story that I think will help us 
encourage us as fathers to see what we are doing, to appreciate what we're doing, and then to be inspired to continue to do it or maybe to do things a little bit differently, a little bit better. And so the first comes from the story. By the way, this is a fun fact. All the stories I'm going to tell you today from the Bible all come from the Gospel of Luke. And the fun fact is this. Most people don't know this. These are the only place. This is the only place in the Bible you're going to be able to find these stories. You don't find them in Matthew or Mark or John. You find them all in Luke. And the first one is from Luke chapter 10. And it's the story of the Good Samaritan. And you know this story as well as I do, I'm sure. But the, it's a kind of a play on words. It's a funny thing. It's almost a joke. A good Samaritan. That would be like someone from Ohio saying someone is good from Michigan, right? Or someone is, I'm supposed to be funnier than that, people. Don't let me down. <laughs> Thank you. The first service cracked up. I don't know. Um, or, uh, you know, whatever. If you're from Texas, if people in Dallas would say, can anybody be good in Fort Worth? Because we don't really appreciate the people in Fort Worth and vice versa. I mean, they're different cities, have different things. You know what I'm talking about. So a good Samaritan was kind of a funny thing. Is there really a good Samaritan? Is it possible for there to be a good Samaritan? Um, so when we talk about a good Samaritan, it's, it's interesting. But it's someone who saw an individual beaten and bloodied and messed up by the side of the road and decides to stop and help them when no one else would help them. Fellow Jews would not help. Rabbis would not help. Sorry, we're too busy. We don't have time. We'll get back to you later. All that type of a thing. They're, they're just too, too caught up to help this individual. But the Samaritan stops and not only helps, cleans the person up, takes them to a, to a nice hotel, pays not only their night stay, but for the next couple of weeks, pays for the medication, says, if you need anything else, here's how you can get a hold of me, and I'll pay when I come back for any extra ex expense that happens. What word correlates with that when it comes to fatherhood? I think it is this. When you think about being a father, being a, someone who is in, invested in their children, you think about this concept, I think, of availability, of presence, of being there, of being there for your children, of being there when they need you, for being there when, not only when they're hurt physically or emotionally or spiritually, but, but being there and available at the moment for them. That's what we can do and what we can continue to do as fathers, and I think all of us in this room most likely you're doing a very good job at that. But if not, we can double our efforts and say we want to be available. We want to be concerned about the details of our children's lives. We want to be there to help them when they know they need it, when they don't know they need it, and just to be a presence, to be there in the midst. The next story is from Luke chapter 11, and it's one that is kind of buried in the Scripture. You don't hear about it too often. Most people, unless they're biblical scholars, probably wouldn't even be aware of it. It's called the bread at midnight story. Now, here's the concept. Back in the day, Jews had this thing about breaking, baking bread. And they lived in such close proximity to each other that if your neighbor was baking bread, you would know it. Now, I may not know if my neighbor is baking bread, and you might not know if your neighbor is baking bread. But back then, it would just, the smell would permeate and go through the walls and up into the air, and everyone would know, oh, our neighbor is baking bread. And there was a concept that if you were hungry, you could go to your neighbor and knock on the door, and you knew they had just baked bread, you could ask them for a piece of bread. And it was, it was a faux pas against societal rules to turn them down. Much like in the Asian culture, you don't want to lose face by doing something that would not bring honor to your family. By not offering bread to someone who knocked on your door, it would cause your family to lose face in that Asiatic concept that uh, they didn't want that to happen to them. So they would offer bread, even if it was at midnight. Someone could knock on the door. Now, there's, a, there's this new thing now. Have you seen it advertised on TV? That you can get an app for your phone and you can put it on your front door. When someone rings your bell, you could be anywhere in the world and you can see who's at the door. I'm sorry, I'm busy at the moment. Come back later. Have you seen that new thing? That's a cool deal. Um, or you can just ignore if you want to. But if you want to know who's at the door, you can see it. They didn't have that back then. And so what, the, what they did have was this, open the door. I want some bread. Now, you and I might say, are you insane? It's midnight. Why are you waking me up? Well, in my case, I'd be up anyway. But I say, why are you bothering me at midnight? But they would say, here's some bread. Please enjoy. That's profound. That's a profound impact you're having on people that they know that they can come to you uh, when they need something. I think as fathers, we want to have not only our presence, 
but a profound impact on our children. And let, they can know that it might be midnight or two or three or whatever in the morning. We're going to be there to talk with them, to listen, to be there for them, to show that awareness that uh, we understand that there's something that they want to talk with us about that they need, and we want to be able to be there for them. That would be the greatest gift, wouldn't it, to one day leave this planet and know that our child or our children remember us by, wow, whenever I needed something, no matter what it was they were doing or he was doing, they dropped it and said, how can I help you? Availability, awareness, having this profound impact. Now, one of my friends who is a member of this church and a distinguished member, a Ph.D. faculty at Ohio State was telling me last week in, in relation to the sermon I preached that, remember I mentioned about suicide, and she was telling me that from age 10 to 14, the number one killer of children between 10 and 14 is suicide. Why is that? That's mind-boggling to all of us. It's, it's remarkable. What is it that could cause someone at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 to think, there are no other options in life, I've got to take a pill or pull a trigger or jump off a bridge or whatever the case may be. What is it that causes that despair? Could it be bullying at school? Could it be low self-esteem? Could it be some mental or chemical imbalance? Or could it be? Is it possible that it could be this lack of availability and awareness to say, listen, we don't care what happens, what you do, what you don't do, who you are, who you aren't, we love you. I love you. You are significant and important just as you are. You're, mo you're the most special, most wonderful person in the world. That's certainly what I want to share with Emily. I want her to grow up knowing that she is the most fabulous, spectacular person in the whole world. And I know you want that for your children and for your grandchildren as well. And it means sometimes you have to be available at all hours of the night to be there to get involved in the details of their lives. The last story also from Luke is Luke chapter 15. It might be one of your favorites. I think it's one of my favorites. And it's the story of the prodigal son. And the correlating word with this one, you guessed it, it's probably going to start with a P, right? Permanent, permanent relationship. This idea of fatherhood is a permanent relationship. And it goes back to another word. You noticed I've used a P word and an A word. The word that correlates with permanent is authentic, authenticity. It's so important to have this real, authentic relationship that is permanent. That means no matter what happens, no matter what they do, no matter what they don't do, they're always welcome. And you're always going to say, I love you. Now, you know the story of the, the um, prodigal son. He goes off, takes all of his inheritance, does his thing. I assume he went to Atlantic City or Las Vegas, spent it all, enjoyed himself, and the Bible says riotous living. You can fill in the blank, whatever that means to you. I assume he had a really great time. And then he, he came back home, and, and he ran out of money too soon. He, he didn't hit red or the right roulette table or whatever the case may be. Maybe he didn't bet on black, whatever the case. And he ran out of money. And he, he says, okay, what am I going to do now? And he finds himself as a Jew working at a pig farm, which is a, kind of a no-no for them. Uh, and he's thinking, well, at least in my father's house, even as a servant in my father's house, I'm going to be treated better than this. So I'm going to give it a shot and go back home. Now, the father sees the son a long way away. Now, keep in mind in Jewish culture, this is stoic kind of a thing. You've got to come to me. You've got to explain to me why you did what you did. And maybe I'll forgive you. Maybe I won't forgive you. But because we have 712 or 714 rules that if you break one of them, you're an outcast, etc., you can imagine then how this story was completely topsy-turvy. Turned everything on, on its end when, when Jesus is telling the story. Instead of having someone explain and, and cry and, and uh, travail about how sorry they are and how they're going to do better and all that kind of a thing, Jesus paints this father as someone who sees the son afar off and starts running as fast as he can to the child, meets him more than halfway, brings with him a very nice ring with a beautiful uh, ornate stone which signified wealth but also social, social stature, gives him the ring, also a beautiful robe, 
which also signified that he was someone very special and very significant. And then comes back home and says, let's kill the most delicious fatted calf we have. Let's have a barbecue. Let's have a delicious dinner to welcome my son who was lost, but now who is home. This signifies a permanent relationship. Because he took all the inheritance and wasted it, because he went away and just forgot all the, the things that he had been taught, even because of all of that, that wasn't enough to sever the permanent relationship. Now, if you're in a Jewish community and a Jewish family back then, you do one little thing wrong. They're ripping their clothes. Many of you have seen the movie The Jazz Singer, right? You rip your clothes. You know, you're no longer a part of my family. I never want to talk to you again. I never want to see you again kind of a thing. I'm sure it's not just in Jewish families. We see it in Muslim families. I'm sure we see it in Christian families. People are imperfect. And sometimes people become exasperated and say, fine, get out. I never want to see you again. That is foreign to me. It should be foreign to you as, as people who are in love with our families and with our children. Now, I've always come from the concept that you, you should never give up, never quit, never stop trying. We can't always control other people in our lives. And sometimes when they choose to give up, and it's, there's nothing we can do about it. And that's a, a challenging thing, and I understand that all too well. But sometimes in life, in those situations, people just want to give up. In marriages, in families, in churches, in organizations. One little thing they don't like, I'm out the door, I'll see you another day. It seems as though in America today and in the world, there is this transition, this transitory kind of a thing where, well, I'll come and go and we'll see what happens. And that, that sometimes transitions then onto families and children. But those of us in this room and those who are tuning in today, I think, must make a renewed effort to say this is a permanent relationship. And no matter what happens, I'm never, ever, ever in a million years going to give up on you. And I ask you to never give up on me. And we will be in this thing together for eternity as a family. As fathers, we need to realize this permanence and this wonderful relationship. That is permanent, it is profound. It's an opportunity that you and I, as fathers and as parents and as church, fellow church members, community members, can make such a wonderful impact of presence in the life of our young people and people of all ages who are longing for someone to simply say what I've said to you today, and that is that you are very special, you are significant, and I love you no matter what, and I will never, ever quit on you. And so someone then asks us a question somewhere along the line. We forgot to ask our parents, who most of the time are smarter and more loving and whatever than we are. We could say, well, Lord, we, we may have forgotten to ask the specific question, like we saw in the video clip, but we know the essence of what they were teaching us. And so we can find the answer through their example and through your example, Lord of being a good heavenly father through the Holy Bible. May that be your story, and that be my, may that be my story today as we leave this holy place to say we are going to make a significant difference in the lives of our children, and they'll know if nothing else how much they are loved, valued, that our presence and authenticity, availability, and awareness surrounds them forever. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for reminding us how much you love us and that you would go to any lengths, even change societal norms and mores and just turn it all up on its head and say, let's just forget the rules and all the craziness and just all the judgmentalism and let's just say, I love you for you and I'm never quitting on you. And this is a forever permanent relationship. It's simply because of that knowledge that you've given us, Lord, and by the relationships you've put in our lives that we can know that that is true. And we ask you to strengthen us today as fathers, as parents, as friends and family in this church, that we might redouble our efforts, Lord, to be there for one another, for our children of all ages, and for you, Lord, to be examples of your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.